Dum How we doing? Are we uh are we rolling, Megan? We are rolling. Rolling? Um I I we've been shooting all day. We've been shooting the show. It's been a joy. I've been in my uh you know, no spoiler here, but I've been in my American flag bandana all day. This is a lot of fun. To just or as we have started way. referring to it, I think you came up with this. Started referring to it as his Americas. No, Charlie. Oh, was that Charlie you? came I up with that. Okay, I thought that was you. No, no. Yeah, uh, he's got his Americas on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just put it in the script because I thought it was funny to refer to them. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. My Americas. Is it the jacket? Like you have the, like a jean jacket? What's mm-hmm. the look? Um, I got some really good sweatshirts this year. So oh, Charlie picked up some new Americas. You should take those home, man. I, I will notice. I Might will say I get those. a few like side glances from people that are like, "Oh, you're one of those guys." Well, so we were talking about this today <laughs> in the van. I don't appreciate that. I feel like patriotism has been co-opted by one, you well, know, half uh, yeah. of the country, and so, it's like whole party. Yeah, Every, everyone's an American. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I can already hear the outrage. I'm a patriot. Even, even, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was telling you the story the other day when when uh, my my son had his friends over. Uh, to the house and we were going to watch the USA-Netherlands game, uh, the World Cup uh, USA-Netherlands game. And Miles, my oldest son, his two buddies, I won't name them, uh, were like, yeah, we're going to go for the Netherlands. And I was like, wait, what? What do you mean you're going for the Netherlands? They're like, yeah, we want to go for the Netherlands. I'm like, right, but you're you're Americans. I mean, you you live in the United States. I get, yeah, we just want to go for the Netherlands. And I found myself getting genuinely pissed off. Well, yeah. Have we talked about this on the podcast? No, 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 we haven't. Yeah, because I, it's a bunch of crap. First of all, kid, I it, it, it was it was I, I was getting pissed off. I don't know if it was. Because, You're not from. The, tell me one thing about the Netherlands. Point to the Netherlands on a map. Well, see, okay, so that was the point I was making. I, yeah, exactly, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here's a map, kid. And by the way, he probably Find pointed right out. Netherlands. I would have pointed it right out. They're still in they're geography. They're so much smarter class. than we are. <laughs> so, so I'm saying, like, nah. they're in geography right now. Oh shit. I bet you they would. Anyway, whatever. But the, yes, but that was the thing that upset me. I'm like, do you have? Uh, that's what I asked them. I said, you have some kind of a tie with the Netherlands. Like, is are you from there? You have uh-huh. some family uh-huh. there? Any any connection to the Netherlands at all? And Spell I can Netherlands. And I can. <laughs> and they were like, no. And I just was fucking pissed, man. I was uh, like, Mr. Howerton, I don't like rooting for a loser, and I think statistically, uh, America's not. Get out of my house. <laughs> <laughs> it was so much jockier. I'm than, with you. I'm well. Yeah, right. He's, he's jockey. It was jockey. It was very jockey. It was all very like, oh no, oh, no. we're probably gonna lose. I don't want to root for the loser. <laughs> they didn't say that, but you're probably right. That's what's behind it. Well, it? listen, yeah. that's what's behind it. I'm a I'm a GD patriot. Okay, mm-hmm. I am a patriot. And so I took it very personally, and I I was surprised at how personally I was taking it. But I, but it made me in some ways it made me feel good because it made me feel like, wow, I really do care a lot more about this country than I even maybe realized. I, mean, I yeah. had a moment wearing my Americas today, aside from all the sideways glances I was getting <laughs> from extras who were like, "Is he safe?" But, um, uh, um, where well, uh, the bandana around yeah, the head. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. like the bit's a strong choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I had a bit of a Rob Justice to speak about our absentee friend here. But like, um, I had a moment where I, I was looking at a guy on set, and I was like, "This guy does not work here." Mm-hmm. Now he looked like a grip. He just looked like a grip. He had a big beard. He was a big guy. He like uh, had on like a kind of a ruddy baseball hat. He had an army backpack. He had a couple things hanging off the army backpack. He, he was looking at his cell phone and he was just kind of hanging around like one of the tents. But I was like, where's Something was off. two things I noticed. I'm like, where's this dude's walkie, right? Because oh, all the guys smart. on set have a walkie. And why isn't this motherfucker working? Like everybody around here is working. Like uh-huh. we're set. Like someone's bringing the pipe over here and pulling. And what's the there. backpack for? And what's the backpack? Why? Why still this late into the day? Like sure, you bring your backpack, yeah. you drop it off yeah, you somewhere, put it somewhere, and then you're working. And he was just kind of lingering around and lingering around. I was yeah. just like, I was watching him. I was like, he keeps looking at his phone. And then I, I, I talked to Zandra, who's a um, second AD. Yeah, yeah, second AD. And uh, and I said, hey, do you recognize this guy here? And look, there's, there's hundreds of people on the set, right? Sure. So it could be, and a guy could be day playing. He could be working for the day. Sure, sure. She's like, no, I don't, I don't. And she's like, where's his walking? I'm like, where's, where's the man walking? <laughs> uh, now, he never actually looks at us like noticing this, but he starts to kind of drift his way off the set. And then she asks like one of the Teamsters and then he like walks off and he. Did he, anybody check his backpack? 
No, like, well, he took his backpack with him, but... No, that's what I'm saying. Oh, but whether it belongs to someone else? Or, or if he, like, took shit and put it in the backpack. He definitely drifted on the set, was looking to steal something. No, yeah. It but, had that like, look. you also don't want to, like, stop some guy who's in the electric department and be like, hey, man, do you work here? But, like... Yeah. There's also, like, you get a weird spidey sense where mm-hmm. you're like, oh, man, like, got some vibes off this guy and i don't yeah. know what he was doing but something it, about your america's also like, about my had, you, had man, you fired up did you go america all over his ass thing? yeah did you think about going america <laughs> I all over I, if i had to i would have <laughs> uh, but i didn't have to he sensed the america in me <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah i didn't want to go to war with and you he thought, you know what i'm not going to war with this guy this guy spends a lot on defense i can't tread on this guy i can't tread on this guy he's too free yeah he's too free baby <laughs> Other than security risks, are you guys having fun on set? I'm like sad that yeah. I haven't really. I, yes. I stopped by set the other day for like two seconds. Well, you're 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 directing an episode. Or I'm going to direct two episodes. Yeah, yeah. coming We're up. We're going to see a lot of each other really soon. But right now, you're really uh, picking up the slack for us on yeah. the last two side. episodes, which Big still time. need writing. And you've been uh, with the room and leading everyone on the charge of how to get them good. And I Go. know they will be good because you're very good at your job. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. And if they're not, I'm going to scream at you. <laughs> yeah, I'm going like, to yell. Put my America's back on. <laughs> get it. Get it. Go. Just have a backpack. Just like wandering around. Yeah. Um, uh, no, it's been fun the last two days, actually. We, we have a script that we're sending to you guys today. So we wrote the script out in two days. Amazing. And I really like it. That's and the, the, oh, well, I can't say. Yeah. Well, we I, should, I know which one it is. Maybe we should. Rob's not here. He doesn't care about spoilers. And uh, it was really great. And I think the, your favorite part about the script, though, is that it's 25 pages long. Oh, <laughs> we do <laughs> like that. You guys are going to like that. Yeah. <laughs> we do like that because it means we can improv. We can, yeah. I'll tell we you can what, fatten it up on the day. Yeah. One thing I think we did really well this season was just getting in a pinch of like, okay, time was getting tight. And we're like, okay, let's, we got to work fast on some of these what's a funny location and who are funny characters Mm -hmm. and just like, you know, bringing the mothers back and uncle Jack and, you know, we were working with Andrew Friedman today. Allegedly. Allegedly. (laughs) Uh, And he is so funny. He's fantastic. He's so funny. Yeah. Everything, you look at the guy, everything he says is like comedy gold. And we're like, it's also like, I don't know, everybody we work with is just so lovely too. What is that? Do we we just attract lovely people? Because they're not. They don't come back. Oh, they don't come back. I want to bring them back. Although we really have, like, hasn't happened though. No, it hasn't happened. We've no, not I mean, I'm trying a to single. There's I a... think there's something about making a comedy too, where uh, I've noticed that even like if you work with someone who has a reputation, it, everyone wants to be on their best behavior because they they don't want to kill the the mood. joy. But it starts the at mood, the top yeah. too. It starts at the top. Like if the vibe on set, because I think there are some people who can be yes awful when they're in a situation where their their heckles are up or their their egos being threatened in some way yeah, yeah. and then they can go on the offensive but when they feel like they're in a like a happy place with happy people who are excited to see what you have mm-hmm. to bring to the table open to what you have to bring to the table open your ideas in the movie that I just did um I won't I worked with an actor who's a very very well respected very well known um actor on this film and you know when he first showed up I could tell he was like he was like kind of bullshit am I going to be dealing with here? You know what I mean? But everybody on that set was great, you know, uh, including myself. I tend to be, you know, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm friendly. I'm a nice guy, you know? Yeah, you're great. I'm um, and, uh, and he just, he, I just watched him, like, over the course of the first day of shooting with him, just I just watched him melt. Mm-hmm. And then by the end of it, he was like, that, this was amazing. Like, he mm-hmm. was like, we're best friends, and it was mm-hmm. great. You know, but he but he came in, like, because you don't know what you're going to get. Like, am I going to be dealing with a bunch of assholes? Is you know, is, is the guy I'm going to be acting with yeah, a dick? Yeah, you know, people the- can have their guards up. Um, I was just, the most exciting part of the process of this movie I directed, wrote and directed Fool's Paradise. Coming, coming out, out soon. Coming, coming out May 12th. Soon. Coming out May 12th excited. in theaters. You get to go see a funny oh, movie good. in theaters. I may or may not be in this movie. You are most definitely in the movie <laughs> and most definitely fantastic in the movie. Uh, but... Uh, John Bryan, who did the score for Punch so Drunk awesome. Love and Eternal Sunshine and Spotless Mind, had been doing the score. And we had a full orchestra the other day. And it was the one of the most exciting things I've ever been a part of. I, you know, I was there thinking, okay, if I'll, you know, chime in. I didn't, I had to do nothing but sit back and watch this man do his magic. But to hear a full orchestra of musicians 
uh, scoring a film and then to know you're in the same room that they recorded Wizard of Oz. At one point, John's like, get up there and hit that gong chime because they that's the same one they use in Wizard of Oz. I was oh, like, wow. you want me to do it? I also think I got the timing wrong like three times. He's like, it's fine, we can edit it. <laughs> <laughs> but that was just a magic experience. But on that movie, I got to work with Ray Liotta who has oh, rest uh, sadly house. passed yeah. away. And I, So awesome. I, I, he would always kind of call me over the many years that I was I kept tinkering uh -huh. in post and rewriting and reshooting things. And he'd be like, you know, when's it coming out? And uh, he was proud of his own performance in the movie. He, he has a be really- in a comedy. He, he yes. doesn't do, you don't see the guy do a lot of comedy. He's very funny. And I, I saw a transition in him from like day one or two where he's like, all right, what's the vibe here? A lot of questions, not sure about everyone to just really sinking in. Leaning and like, in and just- Oh, you're going to let me be a little free. Mm -hmm. Have fun. Yeah. yeah. And like, I think- I think the people thing, the, really the, respond to that. The greatest lesson I had on on this movie was that just get the most talented people I can and then let them free. Mm -hmm. You know, like working with John and, and you and Ray and uh, uh, Leslie Jones, who came in and did an edit. Tim mm -hmm. Roach, you know, who started our yeah, edit. Yeah. With Leslie Jones, who also cut Punch Drunk Love and mm -hmm. like Thin Red Line and amazing movies. Just sometimes a big part of the process is just finding people and staying out of their way. But there's a long way of talking about my movie, which I'm very excited to talk about, <laughs> to go back to like good and bad behavior on set. I find that in comedies, like in Horrible Bosses, of course, we all know uh, there are some people who have gotten in trouble since that movie has come out mm -hmm. and might have had reputations of, of being difficult on set. But like when people are with comedy people, they, they don't often bring that energy. But you've worked on a show and seen some really bad behavior. Yeah. From. There's been, and it's always tough because just for what Glenn's talking about, it's like you ruin the mood and like comedy can't really yeah, exist in that. like a, or it can, but it's like you have to work so much harder for it. I think one of the things that you guys do, you guys move so quick that it doesn't have time to become like really boring and stale and like it stays <laughs> fun and joyous. Yeah. And it, I have more of the experience on Sunny of like, oh no, it's over when, when we're done oh, with good, a scene. Yeah. Right. Like even directing, I'm like, oh, I don't get to, okay, fine. That's we're always cross shooting the way we are right now. There's a camera here, yeah. there's a camera there. So when I'm talking to you and Sonny or once, you, it's all in real time. By the way, Danny, today we were talking about that because Heath said, you know, can you not look at Heath uh, Collins, a great director, but the way we were blocking a scene with Andrew Friedman, I said, can you actually not look at Andrew? It's going to be better if your eyeline is. And, you know, we were saying, are you sure it's not passable because the chemistry is going to be better if I'm actually looking at Andrew? And he's like, no, no, it's fine. It's I, I'm like being picky. And the beauty of the show is that we do that. And Danny was like, you know, Milos Forman was always like that. He goes, this one is crisscross, crisscross. Oh, and I you mean, meaning like your eye line is supposed to be not. No, no, uh, no meaning that oh. there's always two cameras. But oh, yeah. oh, to yeah. do that, mm -hmm. you sometimes sacrifice the eye line because you do see the other them. camera. Yeah. Yeah. You can't get you can't get your eyes as close to the Tight, lens yeah. because you've got another camera pointed, you know, where you've got a camera right next or, you know, near you. Yeah. And you, look, in a perfect world, you always have you have time to do all sorts of different things. You you yeah. you do your crisscross and then you <laughs> can get within the two actors but well you decide you, you have to decide yeah. on what the priority of of that particular show is what the vibe of that particular show is but i think that's one of the really fun things about the show is that often there are multiple characters on camera at the same time so you can watch an episode multiple times and never know have noticed like that person's reactions while mm -hmm. the other person was talking you know yeah all my um, favorite movies are that way are the ones yeah. that i can go back to over and over again and pull something out of pull something mm -hmm. new out of it yeah. yeah yeah well uh speaking of episodes we, we're not talking about one today. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't like to talk about recap any of the ones when you guys aren't all here. Yeah. So we can't talk about an episode today because Rob is somewhere. We no, but that's know. okay. That's okay. <laughs> I thought, uh, you know, we're, we're coming at this a little half cocked, totally unprepared. Totally unprepared. But, we're making this up on the fly. We yes. are, but. And podcasts aren't that way usually, right? They're pretty thoroughly yeah, they're really, <laughs> scripted. Well, yeah, really scripted. Tight, <laughs> tightly scripted, yeah. yeah. Um, but I thought it would be really fun uh, since Rob's not here, um, to get into a conversation about acting. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, that's a dig. It's not even a veiled dig. I'll tell you what, though. <laughs> Rob, uh, yesterday on set, had me in stitches. And I know he doesn't sometimes think of himself as actor first, you know, I, I, if you put it in order or whatever. But, man, like, 
when he taps into something. Well, when you have something specific, he's playing something very specific right now. He's yeah. he's doing a very specific gag on the show that was that you know, and in, in much the same way that he was doing when he gained all that weight, because you know, uh, it, to be clear, just for one episode, it's like one yeah. episode where something is happening to his character, which. It, it gets, alters him physically. It alters him physically and the way he sounds. <laughs> and uh, I, I remember having a lot of fun, like, breaking that because I was like, you know, this Rob will be excited because it gives him something to do. I know I'd yeah. be excited I, if it was my storyline in the episode. It's always fun to be like, oh, I'm going to get to yeah. just do something different than yeah. I'm normally doing. I went and to the, he is nailing it. Yeah. He, I went to the makeup trailer to pitch him the rebreak of the story that we were writing this week. And he was getting the prosthesis on, so that was fun. Like I saw yeah, it happening yeah. as There's I was trying some to pitch this facial story augmentation, to him. and it was really. But you could tell he was like delighted. He was like, "Look, look, look!" You know, he was like, yeah. a kid in a candy yeah. store." It was good. Yeah, yeah, he he really clicks into something when you give him something, uh, especially when you give him something very specific to play. You know, and especially when it's different than what he's used to playing. I mean, every, I think we're all the same way. But, but we could we could do a in depth uh, acting our well, approach to acting. Uh, I just thought it'd be a good opportunity, uh, and you know, this might get a little actor nerdy, possibly. I'm okay uh, so, with that. I'm you know, okay with that. Um, but uh, you know, just to kind of almost interview each other. I and, think the the key would be take your own insecurities out, right? You, you hate to like talk about your process of acting. Oh no, I love when, to talk about when, <laughs> when Joaquin Phoenix exists in the world, right? Like, so you're like, oh, why am I? But um, that's <laughs> you, that's not a good way to uh, approach your life or your work. You should yeah, you gotta I'm, be serious about your craft. I'm interested because I'm a non actor, so. Oh, good. You so can you explain to questions. me how acting works. Yeah, well, and then at some point, I'd mystery. love for you to explain to me how writing works. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I do it, but I still don't get it. Yeah, does anyone know? I don't really have that. No, no one knows, but nobody no. knows that, what, how I, to act. Either. No one knows how, yeah, yeah. It's just, you know. Writing, I, know. I can only do if I'm like hammering carbs the entire time, apparently, because that's what I've been doing in the oh, writer's yeah, room yeah. all week. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> sta I'm standing up the whole time and pacing, but also just like hammering pretzels for some reason. Right. I so think it's just like you need a little treat while you're working like you need a little something. brain yeah. needs fuel your brain needs uh, fuel. you're draining know. your brain yeah yeah you need yeah. that extra you know that extra get up and go but when you're acting carbs are your enemy <laughs> <laughs> yeah you guys yep that's right so, Hollywood <laughs> so rule much. number 101 <laughs> well so so I would start by just asking you okay you're gonna hit me first um what was the first what was the very first acting thing that you do. And I, say, and I don't mean like professional. I mean like, what was the first oh. time you performed? Maybe you didn't even realize that, that you were acting, but you no, were performing. I, I was doing plays as a child, like in- How young? Um, well, I think the first like play play was third grade. You know, I think- uh, Really? Yeah, I think in, in first grade or kindergarten, I- I did a thing where I like walked on and held like the intermission sign. And I remember <laughs> holding it upside down and everyone being like, oh, that's so cute. He got it backwards. But little me was like, oh no, I knew that was gonna be funny. And I, did that, <laughs> I did that on purpose. And it was, I remember being like scared that I did it on purpose, but like, oh man, they, they don't know that I did this on purpose. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm already trying to get laughs, like from day one. That was your only role in that play was hold the intermission. Yeah, come out to be like intermission. And you I figured think, out how to make it about you. I'm yeah, because my mom was the like, <laughs> yeah. That's the yeah. sign of a real actor. Yeah, that's the sign of, right, right, right. That, that bodes very well. Yeah. Um, I figured out how to steal the scene from <laughs> others. Uh, but like, I, my, you know, my mom's a, the kindergarten through eighth grade music teacher. So they did like school plays at the school. Yeah. And usually plays had music. And so, um, but, uh, oh, no, it was second grade that we did. Um, we did uh, James and the Giant Peach. Okay. So the first, the first time you performed in something, it was a, it was an actual play. I it played was, James, buddy. I had the lead. Whoa, right wow. out the gate. Right out the gate. Well, you know what? I, my teacher saw something in me. Uh, first, she saw that I was going to have to do second grade twice. <laughs> that was her first observation. She's like, that, first of all, this, this kid's way too young and uh, falling behind. A I, repeat I, performance of second grade. Yes, hey, yes. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> but then she's like, secondly, she's like, he's such a clown. Like, why not, like... Try. Were you a clown? Acting. Were you kind of class clownish? I think, yeah, I think probably. You were always making your friends laugh and clown, or trying to at yeah, least. Yeah, energetic and probably looking for attention. And, uh -huh. and 
But um, yeah, we did James and the Giant Peach, and I had to sing "Smile Though Your Heart Is Breaking." And I remember like having to like work on the song, which was new, like having to work on a song. Mm -hmm. Um, but I remember being like, oh yeah, this is right. And she was like, you should send him to like, uh, auditions and, and things like that. But my parents thankfully were like, no, nah, no, nah, he's just going to be a kid. Um, oh, you're, yeah. you're happy about that though. You didn't, didn't want to go the child star route. No, I, yeah. I wasn't really thinking about it as a career, you know, mm -hmm. I was just like, huh, that's just the thing I did. Um, yeah. And you were, you, I, I think you and I were maybe similar in that way, like, because you were doing other things too. You were into sports and yeah, I I did I did a play again in fourth grade, and then I didn't do anything until my senior year of high school. Um, what? Wait a minute. So from fourth grade to senior year of high school, you didn't do and no. you didn't perform mm -mm. at all. No, no. Um, sports and stuff. Yeah, I started getting more into sports with my uh, baseball. Right. Was yeah, your main thing. my good buddies in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. um, and. Um, super into baseball that was the main thing and then uh, wanting to do a play i remember in high school like seeing the plays in high school and be like oh that looks like so much fun but not knowing how to juggle that and not having the confidence to just go sign up right mm -hmm. just being like i don't know I, I don't know those kids in that world and then my scene but you know by the time you're a senior in high school you I'm, you feel much more confident about yourself and uh, right school and so I did it then. Um, but then, yeah, then it was, I went to high school, uh, college and uh, was still very into baseball and then very quickly realized like, oh, my baseball career is over. And uh, was took like theater one and theater two, which was all my college offer, but they had like an acting club and very quickly fell into it being like, oh, this is the right fit for me. And it always was. And I should have realized that art. The timing was great. I'm glad I didn't do much before mm -hmm. um yeah and then someone while i was there was like uh hey go check out the williamstown theater festival which is like a summer theater festival it was a pretty prestigious thing in western massachusetts and you can intern there and if you do well you can rise through the ranks and that just i went that i went the summer of my junior year and never looked back never stopped doing acting yeah stuff all your friends then. there too, right? I met yeah, yeah, all the friends you... you know here. Yeah, for, you know half the yeah. people we know on the show. Yeah, now, yeah. Glenn, I'm going to throw it right back at you. Where did it all begin? Uh, for me, uh, honestly, I think it was sort of a natural progression. From like, I don't know that I was. I mean, I was. I think I was a little bit class clownish, a little bit, but um, definitely I was always a little weird, like in the sense that I would like. I was always doing like voices and you know what I mean? Like just being, yeah, kind of silly and goofy. Yeah. Definitely trying to make my friends laugh. I was always like playing characters at home. Mm -hmm. You know, when I would watch a movie, I would play, I would just start doing the character. You know, it's like, I didn't know what I was doing. I thought for all I knew, every kid did that. You know what I mean? It mm -hmm. made sense to me. Um, my and then they're like, so nervous. They're like, what is he doing? What is this weirdo doing? You know? <laughs> he just no, likes I, to inhabit other bodies. You know, like, yes, you were just in that yeah, space. Yeah. He could be a psycho, might be an actor. Glenn, just watch. Don't act along. What? Just watch. <laughs> yeah. Not possible. No, but I can see that, right? So you're you're having those feelings that are like, I want to be. I just wanted to do it. You know what I mean? Like performing I, I, in some way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I loved watching movies, but I wanted to do it. And and I, but I didn't know, you know, that that was a thing or that that was an avenue I wanted to go down or anything. But my parent, it was, my parents actually had the opposite reaction. They, they, they watched it and they were like, "This guy want he like wants to do this." You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like clearly. And then by the time I got to like, I think it was fifth grade, and I started doing like, I didn't hadn't done a play or anything like that, but I was doing sketches, like comedy sketches at school. Like sure. whenever there was an opportunity to do something, I would do something like that. And then my parents. Uh, there was in, in my hometown in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, the Alabama Shakespeare Festival is this great, really, really awesome regional theater, like right smack dab in the middle of Montgomery, Alabama. And we would see plays there all the time. I grew up watching theater too. Like my dad, even though he was in the Air Force and his dad was in the Air Force, I think I've mentioned this before, but his dad was a uh, a jazz musician. He played trumpet. He played piano. And his mom and my dad's mom was a dancer. So he grew up around the like very similar to the way I grew up. Like both 
super academic, but also like in the arts. The arts were appreciated. And not yeah. Really, yeah. Yeah. So we would go see theater all the time. That's um, great. And so anyway, uh, there was an actor from the Alabama Shakespeare Festival who was teaching an acting class for kids. And my parents were like, do you want to go do that? And I was like, yeah, definitely. So I was taking this acting class. And then from there, the guy was like, hey, they need a kid just like you to play a kid in one of the plays at, at the Alabama Shakespeare Festival. Would you be interested in doing that? And I was like, okay. yes, absolutely. Mm. You know, I mean, I'd grown up watching Shakespeare, watching classical theater, watching, you know, we lived in England for a short time and we would go to Stratford-upon-Avon and watch the, you know, Royal Shakespeare Company do their thing. And I, mean, I just was enthralled by it. I, mm -hmm. I thought it was amazing. And so the very first play I did was uh, a play called A Month in the Country by Ivan Turgenev. So it was like a Russian, you know, very Chekhovian kind of uh, thing. And uh, and then that was it. I, I, like, I, I was hooked. Wait, so you now. say um, you got hooked. Like, what was it? Was it like the crowd feedback? Was it just the experience of doing the acting? Like, what was the thing that was like, oh, I could do this for the rest of my life? It was, yeah. It, well, even then, I wasn't thinking of it. Uh, I wasn't thinking I was going to make a profession out of it. Mm -hmm. I just loved it. I loved every aspect of it. I love the community. I love the people. I love the world. I love, I just, I loved being on stage. I felt so comfortable on stage. There's a thing too I don't where, know why. I'm sure you probably felt this way, where making a career out of it is, doesn't even cross your mind mm -hmm. because no. you don't know anyone who's a professional actor. You're not growing up in Hollywood where, you know, so-and-so's uncle does it like, or dad. It, it just, it's like a foreign world. They're not real people on the screen, you know, mm -hmm. they're not real people. So, it, you know, it, it just seems, it doesn't even cross your mind. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until, yeah, it wasn't until Williamstown that I saw professional actors who weren't famous that I thought, oh, right. You don't have to grow up to be <laughs> well, yeah, right, yeah. Tom right. Cruise. You could, you know, you can be this be guy and actor, this yeah. person's in his mid sixties and has been yeah. working forever. And I, I don't know, like I, I've never heard of him, but he has a, a career. so. That's all I ever wanted, you know, like, and I didn't really figure it out until, and I kept doing plays all through junior high school at my school and high school. And then, but I still didn't know I wanted to be an actor because I was doing the same thing as you. I was playing basketball. I was playing football. I was super into, weirdly, super into math and science. And I was going to go to, um, to Auburn University to be an aeronautical engineer. Oh. I was signed up for classes. I had a place to live with my friends. I was going to Auburn to be an aeronautical engineer. And then I got a scholarship to this school in Miami. Yeah, what's that school called? New World School of the Arts. Right. And you were there for two years? I was there for two years. They, they, they had offered me a full scholarship. And I distinctly remember my mom coming to me and saying, and this is such a, a rare thing to happen, but it was actually my mom who came to me and said, hey, do you think that if you don't go and try to be an actor that you're going to regret it one day? Mm -hmm. Wow. That's a weighty question for a kid. Yeah. Because <laughs> she was like, because if there's any part of you that thinks you want to do this, you should do it because it's a full scholarship. Yeah. It's not going to cost us a lot of money. And if you want to quit after a couple of years and go be an aeron aeronautical engineer, you can do that later. You know? All right. And I was, so, like, but and I was like, done. Right. So <laughs> then you're there. You're in in college for acting and the bug has bit you full on bite. When does Juilliard start to get on your radar that it's an option that you want to audition for it? Uh, and in addition to that, did you audition for all the other big schools? Did you audition for Yale and NYU and Carnegie Mellon or? Yeah, I auditioned for a bunch of them. Um, I, <clears throat> I didn't uh, audition for those schools out of high school. So I just took the scholarship, went to New World, and then, but my roommate, uh, Chris Romero, shout out. Uh, Chris Romero's good buddy, he, he was from New York, and his good friend, they had gone to a performing arts high school together, and his good friend, his best friend in New York, was going to Juilliard. So he was like, after our second year, he's like, I think I'm going to go audition for, for Juilliard. And I was mm -hmm. like, yeah, let's do it. And so I went with him. How nervous were you for the for the auditions? Honestly, man, like not that nervous. Really? I had such uh, uh, a degree of confidence in myself that was based on I don't know what. 
It just, I just. That's great though. I, mean, I, that, I thought, I thought at the time, I remember, I actually remember sitting in the room, in one of the rooms, just like filled with actors, filled with people. And I remember sitting there and thinking like, oh, I'm better than all these people. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? But it wasn't like a vain thing. It was like no, a confidence thing. I know thing. you're talking about. Like you, ugh. I was like, I can, I, I just felt like. I it felt is a like, profession of diluting yourself. Oh, you know, totally. Right? Like you totally. have to, you don't necessarily have to say I'm the best at everything, but at that young age, it's very useful to, mm. to walk into an audition room and be like, nah, I'm the best. It's a really useful tool just because then you walk into that room with that confidence. And then on when you start to have a career, you have to develop the skill of believing you're another person for you know at least the few mm-hmm. seconds between action and cut if it's on film. But all right, so uh, you 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 do the audition, you're feeling confident, you feel like it goes well. What? How long between the audition and when you hear you got in? And and did you hear from all the schools? Did you get into them all? Did you only get into Juilliard? What what happened there? Yeah, I got into a few. I don't remember which ones. I auditioned in the morning and then. I had to wait a couple of hours to find out who they who, who was going to get called back. And they only called back like five people out of like 500 that were there that day. And they oh, auditioned like people all over the all over the country or whatever. So there's only like five people and I got called back. So I was like, OK. And that was a huge. And when that happened and I was like, I got this, mm. I just knew it. And now I could just as easily have not gotten it. But for some reason, in my mind, I was like, I got this because what that was is that was like, OK, I did something right. So then. So then for the callback, I kind of had, now is the callback was in front of the entire faculty. So like before it was in front of like, you know, maybe three or four faculty members. They called me back. Then there was the entire faculty, like all of the faculty of Juilliard, like theoretically very intimidating. But in my mind, I was like, I don't know. I I just, I was like, okay, if I got called back, that means they like what I did. Mm-hmm. So it gave me even more confidence to lean even further into what I felt like I was capable of. So I had even more confidence. Uh, I was even less nervous in the callback. Mm. I mean, I was nervous. Don't get me wrong. I, I was definitely nervous, but like, I don't know. It was like you felt an, capable of like yeah, delivering on yeah. this thing. There was did an you do the same monologue? Like, do, is it a monologue that you deliver for the for the? Yeah, uh, we had to do. Yeah, we had to do a classical monologue and a contemporary monologue, right. and then, and then uh, in the callback, I did both the monologues, and then they asked me to do like some improv stuff and like. And did you do comedy stuff or drama? I did uh, one. One was like a, the classical piece was like a uh, from Jean Racine's Phaedra, and it was not comedy, like very very serious. And then the and then the contemporary was comedic. Yeah. If I had an edge over other actors, I do remember thinking at the time, like, because I would watch other actors do their monologues. I'd seen what mm-hmm. they do. And I was like, the one thing that's missing from, from almost all these people that I noticed right away was like, they've forgotten that this is supposed to be fun and entertaining. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? They're yeah. forgetting to entertain. It's like, it's it's not about squeezing tears out of your eyes and making people think like, oh, wow, he's such an amazing actor. It's like, fucking entertain people. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? If you look like you're having fun up there, mm-hmm. everybody kind of relaxes and goes, ah, oh, this is this is fun. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. I, I, and they, so, the, so they, then they want to watch you because you make them feel good. I remember it's not about having, you, yeah. it's about them. Similar experience. This was later after I was starting to work at Williamstown a lot, but the, like we would every now and then do like a showcase in New York. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember like, yeah, you, people do like six really serious monologues and I come out there and do something funny that like Eric Bogosian yeah. wrote. And then yeah. it's like, oh, that just gets everyone's attention. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's but, exactly what I did uh, upon graduating from Juilliard. I did, we had to do two, you know, you had to do like a showcase or whatever. We did two, two things and I chose comedies for both because I was like every single person in my class is doing these like ultra serious, like deep, heavy. And I was like, I'm going to fucking entertain the shit out of people. Yeah. And stand Because like, why not? See what happens. Yeah. Rob's not here. So for the purposes of this ad, Charlie will be playing Rob. Today, we are brought to you by DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of Super Bowl 57. And guess what? New customers can bet just $5 and get $200 in free bets instantly. Rob, how do you feel about that? Oh, I'll tell you, Charlie. 
Plus, all customers can get in on the Super Bowl 57 excitement with DraftKings Happy Hour Super Boosts. Check the DraftKings Sportsbook app each day between 6 and 9 p.m. Eastern to see which prop bet gets boosted. Who you got, man? Who, who's your Who's your pick this year? What do you mean who I got? The birds. The birds are in it. Who do you got? My money's on Brady. Oh, you're not taking the Eagles, Glenn? Oh, I don't bet against Brady. I've learned that lesson time and time again. I'm going to leave in all this stuff in the middle. <laughs> okay, one, remember when the Eagles beat him? And two, Brady's not even playing. What, what happened? Is he hurt? Ah, uh, no, he just didn't make it. Yeah, I'm not buying it. Nice try, though. Go ahead and bet on him, Glenn. Leave that Eagles money to the rest of us. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code ALWAYS. So angry. <laughs> so angry. He's just looking for a bit of justice, probably, Glenn. Yeah. So uh, new customers can bet $5 on Super Bowl 57 and get 200 in free bets instantly. Only a DraftKings Sportsbook with code ALWAYS. Now, hang on a second here, because minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. Void in Ohio. See show notes for details. Rob is not here today, so for the purposes of this ad, Glenn will be reading the part of Rob. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Turn your hat around backwards, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> BetterHelp is an online therapy service where licensed professionals can help you tackle issues you may be dealing with or just help you feel your best in general. When do you guys feel your best? Me? Oh, uh, right after a shower. <laughs> yeah. That's a good one. A nice cold shower. Oh, okay. Well, you had me going there for the first part. The second half kind of threw me. Dude, 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 dude. No, cold showers rule, man. They're actually proven to reduce depression and symptoms of anxiety. Yeah, so you, you ought to feel your best, you know, coming out of one. Kind of like a like a great therapy session. Now, Meg, uh, you, you've you used BetterHelp, right? Is it, is it anything like a cold shower? Yeah, I can attest that BetterHelp was great for me in the sense of working through an issue with someone I felt like understood it. I can't attest to the whole cold shower thing, but no, right. it's pretty good. Right, right. You guys are missing out on greatness. BetterHelp? As stimulating as a polar plunge. In a good way, if I'm being unclear. And it's convenient, flexible, affordable, and entirely online. <laughs> if you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. So visit betterhelp.com slash sunny today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash sunny. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> So I, I went one summer as an intern to Williamstown, and then you can audition to get in. I remember being so nervous about the audition, and I was like, I went across the street to get a beer to like calm down. And nice. I, you know, I was like 21, I think, um, maybe 22 already. But like, I'm in the audition, and I'm doing Danny in the Deep Blue Sea, I think oh, it yeah. was. Yeah. And uh, I'm saying my line, and he's like this kind of like brooding guy. It's like uh, you know, before I only did comedy shit, like. I'm playing like a blue collar kind of brooding guy. And I I kind of like punch the air conditioner, like not hard, but just like a little like, you know, like eh, well, whatever the line is. And the thing like the front of it comes off the wall and crashes. <laughs> <laughs> and I just quickly improv like, see, everything I touch turns to shit. And then I just keep going on with the nice, monologue. Nice. And apparently someone pulled me aside after I got in and be like, that's what for us, all of us said like, oh, he's, yeah. he's an actor because he's in it. Like, he's, he's in it. Yeah, he, yeah. He wasn't thrown by that. He, went he wasn't thrown it. by it. Right. Which is, you never know like what little moment is. Well, I learned very something. quickly. I'm like to, the, that lesson of like, oh, people only get uncomfortable if you're uncomfortable. Sure. You know what yeah. I mean? So if you fuck up, you know, like, and I. I well, that's the big, like, like when you watch people host SNL, if they seem like they're having fun, yeah. it's a great episode. Yeah. If they seem like they're nervous up there, ooh, but it's well, you, get, you get nervous. You you get get nervous. Yeah, the you audience is like feels bad for them, and yeah. so I I always notice it's like the audience doesn't want to make any noise almost because they they're yeah. wor they're too worried to make noise one way or the other for yeah. like the person. Yeah. Then it gets, but yeah. yeah, when you come out and you're like, I got this, like don't yeah, worry, I'm, take, yeah, yeah, everybody yeah relax. you exude that. But I don't know that you can fake that. I think like you really have to be 
feeling like I, I tried to do stand up uh -huh. for a while when I first started in comedy in New York. And like, I just wasn't enjoying myself on stage. So I could write funny jokes, but like, you could just tell when I was up there that I wasn't liking it. And so then the audience like didn't <laughs> like, they were just yeah, like, yeah. I don't you feel know. as though you've gotten more comfortable with the concept of being a performer just from doing this podcast? No, I just. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I was, I, I thought about that too. I'm like, I'm like, are you weirdly becoming like more no. comfortable on camera and more at ease performing? No, it's still really hard for me to watch the edits of these. And I, and I like, I'm irritated. I, I don't, enjoy, <laughs> I don't enjoy watching it, but I don't think of this as a performance. Well, I think of not, this as yeah. just talking to you guys, which I enjoy doing and which I've gotten comfortable doing because we're in the room. So to the extent that I perform in front of you because I pitch you guys stuff and like try to entertain you and make you laugh, I feel comfortable doing that. But I don't really just like in my mind think of this going out anywhere. I know that it um, does. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. Yeah, if I you're know. uncomfortable with like seeing yourself on camera, you're the same as every performer in the history of sure. show business. Like, yeah, totally. But it's amazing you guys can watch yourselves perform as much as you do because you're in the edit bay watching it all the time and not have that like weird. I tell you what, it's a good way of just like uh, just getting over it yeah. because like you just do it for so many years. You're like, ah, I guess that's what I look and sound like. You know, like <laughs> I thought I was completely over it after spending years and years in the edit uh, on the show. And then I watched, you know, a cut of uh, the, I think I can, yeah, the Blackberry movie. I was like, can I talk about this yet? Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh, and I, and I, I thought the movie was great, but I just, I was like, God, this is really hard to watch myself. Oh, really? But yeah. And I just, what, and oh, I, your it was. acting or the way you looked? No, no, not the way I looked. No, um, my acting. Oh, well, that's, that's it was different. In, in this role, I will say, I mean, I, I am uh, exploiting a side of myself that I don't like. Oh. That's there that I repress because it's not, because it's ugly and I don't like it. I don't like it as a, as I don't like people that are like that. And it, the role requires me to, required me to uh, be a person that I don't like. And so when I watch it, I'm like, I don't like that person. Oh, okay. Well, that's but, different than not liking your acting. I think that's well, like, you like separate. your acting so much. I, I know, that you, I know. <laughs> yeah, no, I know, person. I know. <laughs> so, all right, so you you go through uh, Juilliard, you get an agent from a, a Juilliard showcase, and then you're pretty much off the races. I did exactly what they told us not to do. And, I, and they were like, don't sign with somebody until you do the showcases. But by, by the time we did the showcases, I already Well, we had this conversation the other day in the van to set where somehow we were talking about that time of our lives. And I was saying, you know, I, I had around that time, I would thought, oh, boy, it'd be nice to go to an acting conservatory and get that training. But I, I also had through Williamstown gotten an agent, was starting to get auditions, was starting to get roles. So I was like, well, that feels like a step backwards. Totally. And, and I, I also was like, I have a lot of confidence and I don't want to spend four years having someone break me down and be like, hey, your voice is too high and scratchy, yeah, yeah. you know, or like <laughs> yeah. whatever it is. So uh -huh. I, I was like, ah, fuck it. That's but, a good instinct. But yeah, I think I dodged a bullet there. But me too. And I was saying, you know, was it tough to survive that? And you said a really funny thing about, and I think it's the absolute right advice, which is that you learn to just ignore the acting advice, which is to say, <laughs> I, I think you're right, which is to say, you're not, not listening. You're listening to what they have to say. And if something you like from it, you'll use it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you'll ignore it. You know, it's funny. The part of that story that I didn't tell was that in my rebellion against what I was being taught, I, I learned that I hadn't really been listening before. And I started actually listening because I gave, I, I gave up on trying to, I think when you go to such a prestigious institution like Juilliard, because it's got this like stigma attached to it, albeit a positive one, I guess, but um, is you, you, you just, you have so much deference for the teachers there, right? And, and I saw, I, I, I realized at a certain point in my, this was actually the begin, beginning of my third year there, that I got some really bad feedback in a play. And it pissed me off so bad that I just went, fuck this shit. I'm not gonna listen to anything else these people say. Yeah. I fuck it. I'm just gonna, I'm, I, was like, I was like, I've forgotten what it was like to enjoy acting. I'm gonna go back to that. I'm not gonna do anything they tell me to do. I'm just gonna have fun. 
And in that, what I learned was I was like, oh, I've been doing, and so much, many of us had been doing the program in order to please the teachers, mm -hmm. right? In order to make them be like, you're getting it. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes, you know. And then I, and I realized, I was, like, I was like, why am I doing this for them? I'm the one who's spending all the money to go here. This is for me. Mm -hmm. I'm like, they're there to serve me. To service that's my smart. needs. That was wise, you know, for your age. Yeah. Because yeah. you're young, you're vulnerable, you want, like, that's around the age where you said, okay, I'm committing to acting, so you want it bad, right? Yeah. Like, and, that, yeah, you're so but I also, impressionable is the right word. I was so lucky because my parents were so loving and supportive that I felt like I had a foundation of love and support. So it was like, in some ways, the love and support of the teachers was became less important to me because I was like, I, I have that. I don't need that shit. I need you to teach me how to act. Mm -hmm. And if you don't like what I'm doing, I don't give a shit. <laughs> I don't give a shit. Yeah, You're not the fucking audience. Uh -huh. You're not the fucking audience. You're my yeah. teacher. Teach me how to act. If you don't like something, let's fix it. Let's work on it. That's fine. But don't try and fucking berate me. Don't bring me, don't try to tear me down. It's also don't not try a, and, there's, it's, 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 there's not a science and there's no one mm -hmm. way that's going to work for everyone. Like, yeah. Everyone has a different method of how they get to do it. And then everyone has different opinions on whether or not they're doing it well. It's yeah. the, like you can teach someone how to fly a plane and you go, you better be pretty damn exact about that. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, like, yeah, you don't want to get too arts, artsy fartsy about flying <laughs> yeah, yeah, an airplane, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 but yeah, yeah. I do yeah. think well, the way that you, where do I feel? Fuck them. They don't do know I me. How do I I'm feel flying like, this plane for me. How do I feel like landing today? What's your motivation here? Uh, not killing everyone on the plane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As much good as advice I got, I also got a lot of bad advice, and still to this day get bad advice. Yeah. I mean, even on this movie that I'm finally getting out there, like you know, when I was trying to retool it and re-edit it and work on scripts, I sent it to one writer friend who was like, "You, you got a great acting career. Just give up and move on." I'm like, "Give mm -hmm. up? What are you talking? I love this thing. This is uh -huh. this is great. I'm talking about making changes." Yeah, yeah. So you know, <laughs> if you have a passion and a vision. Yeah. You have to, and like, if you want to be an actor or a writer and you are passionate, you have a vision, you yeah. have to like go all, all, yeah. all, what's that? All, no, all coins in, all, what's all in, term? all, yeah. in, all yeah. guns blazing. I didn't there's, want to say guns blazing. There's really no like good ideas that aren't ideas that someone saw through to the end of being like, nothing just is so good that it kind of moves itself. Like a, a person pushed that boulder Almost up that hill. Almost every single time somebody Almost. had a push. It, it really, yes. and, and you only in getting to the end realize that it was a good idea at the end of it. But like, it's, it's, it's not that I, I've had this with scripts, like the scripts that end up really great and the scripts that end up horrible were equally as hard to make. You know, mm -hmm. you just have to keep pushing through to the end to see whether it's going to like work or not. We've all known those people too, who are just like, who are just like, how do I become a professional writer? And you're like, well, first of all, if you, what have you written? Oh, well, nothing. Oh, well then you're fucked. <laughs> yeah. You, and you know, right away, you're like, you're never going to, you are never yeah, going to work. Try it out. See if you like you're it. You're never going to work. <laughs> Same thing with like, I would have actors, like yeah. actor friends you know, come to me and be like, how do I get an agent? And I'm like, well, are you doing anything right now? No. Like, well, why aren't you doing a play? Well, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I'm like, are you in an acting class? No. Do I'm like, you're not, you're not doing anything. You're yeah. not like- Just I, waiting for somebody to give you a job instead of building your skills that can get you that job. Yes. And, and then once and you get the job, you know how to do the job. You know how to do the job because you've been important. practicing. I but, mean, I was listening to an interview with uh, Scorsese and De Niro. I was just like flipping through what like podcasts have been dealing with a lot of traffic working on this lot. So I was like, all right. I was like, oh, wow, this is an old interview of these guys from Tribeca Film Festival talking about their movies. And it was so interesting to hear how many of the movies they did, De Niro was bringing to Scorsese being like, we should do this one. We should do tax, we should do, um, uh, I think it was Raging, Raging Bull. Bull. Yeah. We, should, we should do Casino. And you're like, right, he's not just waiting. He's like, come yeah. on, man. I want, and these are some of his most iconic Film roles. Yeah. If you really want to get the things that you're passionate about, that you're actually excited about, not just work, you know, uh, you have to, yeah, you got to continue to hustle. Yeah, you. I, I mean, the phone is ringing for so very few people. Yeah. And what's interesting is like you get to a certain point 
the calls you get are are the movies where you'll help them, where it's sure. like, hey, we we can't get the money, but you'll help. That's us. right. Yeah. But you don't get the calls where the it will help you. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, no, that's exactly right. That's like, a really good point. Unless you're yeah, lucky, yeah. and then every now and then. No, you're 100 you know, like, right. Yeah, um, or you're bringing to the table like you wrote the movie. Like so, you wrote the movie, yeah, yeah. So you get to be the lead of it, and then you yeah. get to cast. And like, even then, really it's amazing. like a constant sure. battle, even to get it done and get it sold. Mm-hmm. And like then you get stuck because you want it to be great. And you know, I, I, I uh, fortunately I got to call Guillermo, and Guillermo was wasn't like, "Hey, give up." He was like, <laughs> "Put everything into making yeah. it as good as you can." And he was, I think, God, I did. Guillermo, of course, being most famous for playing for Pappy McCoyle. Yeah, that's what he's known for. That's what he's most known uh, for. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's how you guys started doing it. Why are you still doing it? Still doing what? Acting? Acting, yeah. I I I <laughs> I love it so much. I have yeah. often uh, you know, I just I've said so many times I'm like I just want to be an actor. I just want to be an actor. I don't want I don't want <laughs> to write. I don't want to produce. And and yet I can't seem to stay away from all the other stuff too. I don't know. It's like uh I I, I can't I, I think I just can't, I don't have really, uh, I'm not good at just sitting back and waiting for things to happen. So I inevitably end up getting involved in something. And I mean, God knows, like I've, I've tried to write and produce so many things that didn't, haven't gotten made. Sure. I have imposter syndrome when it comes to almost everything other than just being an actor. Uh, I've been writing on Sonny for 16 years, since the very, very beginning. And, you know, uh, when people refer to me as a writer, I'm like, nope. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't. I have no idea how to write, which is ridiculous. Yeah, ridiculous. You know what I mean? I, I still struggle with identifying as anything other than an actor. Well, going back to the, uh, you know, whether or not someone should or shouldn't pursue acting, I don't know any. I, I by this point in our lives, we know people who started out and have sort of given it up. I don't know a single person that's that who gave it up, who regrets the time that they did it. Sure. Right. Like, I, I don't know anyone who was like, oh, man, I really regretted doing those three movies or doing those plays or doing that television series mm-hmm. or whatever it was. So I, I think there is value if, if it is something that you really feel as though you love and you want to do. Yeah. Give it a shot. Give it a shot. 